right. Well, I think I'm going to um, I'm going to kick off, um, and people can join join as they arrive. So, welcome everyone this afternoon to our Creative Commission session with the folks around ecology and sustainability. It's uh, hosted by uh, Green Minds and Mobility Hubs Partnerships, uh, both led by Plymouth City Council, um, supported by Low Carbon Devon and, and Plymouth Culture. Um, and we've also got one of our Green Minds partners here today, Plymouth College of Arts, who are playing a key role in this creative uh, commission. So yeah, I want to thank you all for taking your time to come to the session workshop today. I do appreciate people are busy and uh, well, lots of lots of things on, but we wanted to put this session on around our creative commissions before uh, we went out for our call to tender. Really is a chance to explain a bit of the background and the detailed commissions uh, to support in terms of the kind of proposals and application process, but also to um, give you a chance to have ask some questions and uh, ask some questions, get some answers as well. So um, again, we wanted to kind of uh, create a forum where people could come together and do that. So thank you very much. Just to let you know that um, we are recording the session today. So if uh, you might want to keep your cameras off, um, as part of that, the recording will be shared after the event, partly as a, as a way for those people who can't make it to the session today, they can still have um, um, a look at the session and get the same information as those people who are able to attend as well. And we'll also be sharing the presentations. Please do put your questions in chat as you go along, because we'll try and pick up as many questions as we can. Um, there's a few people that are involved in the projects here today, so they can hopefully answer some of those questions. And like I said, we have got question and answer time um, built into the agenda today as well. So. Um, I just wanted to kick off with them uh, to tell you a little bit about the process. And today, um, like I said, we have got quite a busy agenda. We'll be giving you an overview of the, the Green Minds, Mobility Hubs and Low Carbon projects. Um, and then we, we're really lucky today to be joined uh, by Carly Butler from the Nature Connectedness Research Unit at the University of Derby, who will be um, sharing some of the inspiring work that they've been doing around their research, but also in arts-based projects in the north of the country. And uh, Hannah Harris um, will hopefully be joining us uh, from Plymouth Culture, again, really looking at um, how to shape proposals. So some kind of tips and techniques to help you um, develop proposals, uh, not just for this commission, but, but commissions in general. So that's really exciting. And then with the, the kind of last part of today is really about finding a bit more about each of those individual briefs that will be coming out around the commission. So again, chance to have a bit more detail, but also um, um, ask any questions that come up as part of that. So in terms of the Creative Commissions programme that we've put together with Green Minds, the Mobility Hubs and Low Carbon Devon, we will be producing a series of eight creative works, five under the Green Minds partnership and three under the Mobility Hubs. But we do, although there'll be each commission will have a separate brief, we really want them to be kind of exhibited, curated as part of an overarching, uh, overarching series. So I think that's really important to bear in mind. Um, we will also, um, as part of today, touch on some of the procurement work that we've been doing. All the procurement is going to happen through Plymouth City Council through, and, and our system. And I just wanted to flag it up right at the beginning. And, and I know we've been promoting this as part of the event as well. You do need to sign up on to supplying the Southwest. I would advise that you've done that by the end of today because the tender call will go out tomorrow. So, um, and uh, someone um, in the team is going to post that uh, website link in in um, in the chat function, and we'll talk a bit more about that. But that's really important. I can't stress how important it is that you register on that portal. Otherwise, fortunately, we are unable to um, share the kind of tenders and the um, commission call with you. So I should really introduce myself. <laughs> um, my name's Gemma Sharman. I'm the Green Minds Programme Manager based at Plymouth City Council and I've worked in Plymouth probably oh, for over a decade now on natural environment projects in a variety of forms. Um, so to start with, I'm, we're going to tell you a little bit more about some of the projects and really how this Creative Commission process has come about. So um, if we go on to the Green Minds Programme, thanks Indy, um, I just want to share a little bit of um, uh, I suppose where that project's come from, some of its kind of key aims. And also for Chris Smith at Plymouth College of Arts, who's the project coordinator there, and he will talk a bit more about Plymouth City Council, uh, Plymouth College of Arts' role in the partnership, but also in these commissions specifically. So Green Minds is, um, is like I said, it's a partnership project. So as well as the College of Arts, we're working with the University of Plymouth, Devon Wildlife Trust, uh, the National Trust, Data Place, uh, Real Ideas Organisation. Um, and it's all funded by um, European Regional Development Fund under their Urban Innovation Actions Programme. 
So that program is really um, about some of the kind of big urban challenges that we face. And in particular, our call of funding is around sustainable land management and how we can find nature-based solutions, um, some of those urban challenges. So as I see it, um, you know, nature-based solutions, I think there's a nature-based solution for everything. So it could be, you know, um, improving air quality, it could be um, alleviating flooding, but it could also be about supporting health and well-being, um, connection to nature, you know, better education. So I think it's, it's quite very broad ranging. And really our, our vision within um, Green Minds was we kind of sort of the strap line around rewilding people and places because what we wanted to do was start to how can we shift in the city of Plymouth to um, kind of give nature a role in our decision making? How can we shape Plymouth to be much more of a nature city? And to do that, it's obviously not just about rewilding spaces. It's also kind of about people's connection to nature and, and the value that they place on that and their kind of attitudes to nature. So really, we wanted to look at um, the, starting to address the issue that where, where humans have put themselves outside of nature rather than an intrinsic part of nature and this is that then about how we look at our attitudes and behaviors towards nature so how we think about it how we engage with it and how we work with it so I just wanted to touch on um, you know we haven't got a lot of time to go into detail today but the kind of key aims of, of Green Minds so again it is very much like I said about kind of practical improvements on the ground how we enhance kind of wildlife and and create better bigger, better, more joined up habitats, how we look at different management approaches, like what are the role of community business and enterprise in, in helping look after spaces? What's the role of our you know, workforce in a kind of more ecologically minded um, land management in Plymouth? What's the role of, of, of you know, residents, um, different sectors, um, you know, whether that's around health and wellbeing, social care, um, developers, you know, how, how we all have a role in kind of supporting nature in the city. We're working very closely with the data place in the University of Plymouth about how we can start to use science and more creative uh, digital tools to, to reveal nature, kind of um, tell the story about what's happening. Um, sometimes nature is quite hidden from people. Um, and then we're also working with the university and other partners to look at how we start to evaluate the impact that we're having on the ground in people's terms of their nature connection, but also actual physical improvements um, and supporting much stronger nature recovery network in Plymouth as well. Uh, we're really keen on how we then start to think about um, kind of communicating what we're doing and learning, but also uh, in terms of supporting people's nature connection, looking at what kind of more kind of creative ways to do that. Uh, so before I talk a little bit more about the creative commissions, I just want to touch on some of the sites that we're doing, uh, what we're working on. Obviously, it's quite big in scope. So we've tried to look at focusing it through five key areas of sites where we'll deliver actually in you know, a very uh, real practical change on the ground that people can engage with. So I'll leave that slide up there. We're very short on time today, but um, have a little look. So, uh, the creative commissions are likely to to be linking to some of those spaces, particularly in the west of the city around the urban trees and rewilding corridors. Um, so we're really keen to um, uh, we're, yeah, really keen to see how we can build connection through those. So essentially. We're, when we started thinking about these creative commissions, um, we were really talking thinking about like you know Plymouth as a habitat and how we all have a role in that habitat management and how we can start to again, as I mentioned, nurture the sense of collective responsibility in terms of caring for green and blue spaces. Um, so we wanted to think again of more kind of playful ways and, and opportunities for uh, others to connect up, whether you're in a community group, as an individual, an organisation. We want to try and see ways of making it easy, accessible for um, people from lots of different uh, backgrounds, communities to participate, that actually also seeing what comes out of communities, you know, not being too prescriptive, not being too fixed with the ideas that we go in. Uh, you know, already we're seeing different communities come up with ideas for their own spaces or neighbourhood that they'd like to uh, put into action. And again, we want to be open to new ways of working. So this is really partly where the Creative Commission has uh, come from, from Green Minds, is that you know we want to, we want to kind of have fun. We want it to be playful. We want to just think of new, different, inspiring ways that might provoke people to start thinking about nature in their neighbourhood or connecting more. Um, and and as you'll find out later this afternoon, we'll go into detail a bit more of the briefs um, about and where those themes have come from. So I just wanted to hand over to a colleague, Chris Smith the project coordinator at the Plymouth College of Arts. He's going to say a bit more about their role. 
Thanks, Wes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah, as as you were saying there, it's um, the project is really about um, connecting people to nature and finding kind of creative ways to do that. Um, so. Um, obviously, that's that's where uh, Plymouth College of Art can can really come in. So we're one of the partners, um, and it's my role um, to um, as the Green Minds Project Coordinator for the Art College to get the staff and students um, uh, in, engaged with the Green Minds Project, and then seeing what they can bring uh, with their creativity to the to the project as well to help engage you know, the the public. Um, so so yeah so. We, we heard about the, when Gemma said that about the Creative Commissions, um, we were like, okay, we really want to help develop that because we can really see um, the, the value of it. Um, so we kind of got, in help, got involved helping to develop the project, uh, to, to, sorry, the commissions. And um, uh, yeah, so we, uh, but there's things we can offer um, to to the to the to the um, artists who have been commissioned. So, for instance, um, there's a potential there for um, our facilities and our, our expertise um, to be to be used by the creative commission. Sorry, the creatives who are being commissioned, um, and also we have obviously the students um, themselves who are really keen to get in engaged with the Green Ones project. So, um, so we've kind of. Um, identified that that um, the these these opportunities and the um, sorry I'm slightly struggling with words here because my screen's really small I can't see what I've got written on it um, so yeah so we have um, uh, amazing facilities and um, and equipment that can be really useful to the creatives who have been commissioned um, although it's really important to sort of point out that um, they would need to um, identify in, in what way they would like to work with us um, in their application. Um, obviously, we can't uh, cover the cost of materials, but we do have sort of, um, facilities and expertise that we can can offer there. Um, so, yeah, so uh, you're welcome to approach me to, to see kind of what we can offer um, as part of the um, uh, our support. That's great. Thank you, Chris. Um, and I've got to say that, you know, Plymouth College Arts have been, fan have been fantastic in terms of really pulling out some of the uh, kind of the themes for the briefs. And I don't I don't think we would have come up with anything uh, quite as kind of playful and fun and thought provoking and uh, without that. So there's some more details about the project, uh, Green Minds. Have a look on the website and some of those links there. Um, and now I will hand over to our colleagues in uh, the Mobility Hub. Thank you. Thanks, Gemma. Hi all, I, um, my name's Indy Nuttall. I'm from the Mobility Hubs project um, from the Low Carbon City team within Plymouth City Council. Um, so now just gonna give a quick overview of the Mobility Hubs project. Um, yeah, what we're hoping to deliver and also our links to the creative engagement and what we wanna get out of, um, yeah, that form of engagement. Um, so due to the recently declared climate emergency and, of course, from the City Council pledging to be carbon neutral by 2030, um, there's an urgent need to consider how we in Plymouth move and travel around the city and also how we best utilise our space. So as a result, the Mobility Hubs project is being delivered with support from the Transforming, uh, Transforming Cities Fund for a three year grant period. Um, we aim to deliver in between 30 to 50 multi, multimodal mobility hubs, creating a citywide network. Um, these will provide viable low carbon transport options for local residents, visitors and businesses, helping uh, people to reduce private car use. Um, so mobility hubs are going to be a collection of low carbon transport integrated into the existing public transport network across Plymouth. Um, so these will comprise of electric bikes, electric vehicle charging points and an electric vehicle car club scheme. Um, so all of those services will be available to rent or hire. Um, other facilities such as live information boards will also be incorporated into the hubs and all of the services will be linked together through a booking system, um, allowing users to plan and book their journeys across the city using low carbon transport. Um, so we aim for the hubs to be a sustainable, future-proof shared transport system um, with space for future innovation and new technologies to be incorporated. Um, so from the deployment of the mobility hubs, we're, of course, hoping for a variety of benefits. Um, 
through the reduction of private car use, carbon emissions associated with travel within Plymouth uh, will be reduced as well as congestion across the city. Air quality will be improved, leading to health and wellbeing benefits of our local residents, um, also partnered with the encouragement of more active travel. Um, the mobility hubs will improve connectivity across the city in a fair and affordable manner, improving, uh, improving employment and business opportunities, whilst also helping work towards reducing mobility poverty and re regenerating communities. Um, so we recognise the importance of behaviour change within the Mobility Hubs project, and this is an element that we hope to actively approach in order to achieve all of the benefits previously mentioned and more. Um, so we hope through creating a large scale citywide project, um, such as the Mobility Hubs, we will ignite local people's interest in low carbon transport, start getting people to ask questions and also making it relevant and accessible to as many as possible. Um, we hope to carry out engagement that gets more people asking questions about the mobility hubs. We recognise that more standard um, engagement techniques doesn't always reach everyone. Um, so we want to use different styles of engagement uh, to interact with wider audiences and begin beginning to prompt behaviour change in transport choices citywide. Um, so we have carried out previous public consultations within the mobility hubs project. Um, particularly around community engagement, as well as um, certain components that local people would like to see incorporated into the hubs. Um, from these consultations, we've, uh, we were able to identify some engagement techniques uh, that attendees felt would work well with local people within Plymouth and also topics of interest that should be addressed through our engagement. Um, so creative engagement, oh, sorry. Um, creative engagement was identified within our consultations as an effective way uh, to create fun and educational uh, engagement. And that's what we're hoping through the creative commissions. Um, we want to utilize creative engagement to reach wide, diverse audiences across the city by creating fun and exciting creative commissions, which are accessible to as many as possible. Through the creative series with Low Carbon Devon and Green Minds, we want local communities to be able to help shape the creative commissions. We want their work to incorporate educational links to uh, low carbon transport, its benefits, and also the importance of, sus of sustainability as a whole, which of course is at the heart of um, all of our projects. We want to begin to tackle some of those more trickier uh, subjects um, in an accessible way. Um, and we want to be able to demonstrate to local communities that the mobility hubs are for everyone and allow them to feel ownership over their local hubs. Um, so that's a kind of broad overview of the mobility hubs project for now. Um, you can find more, more about the mobility hubs uh, project on the Plymouth City Council website. I've attached a link there, but I'll also post it in the chat. Um, but now I'll just pass over to Emma to give an overview of the Low Carbon Devon project. Thank you, Indy. Hi, I'm Emma Whitaker, um, the research fellow for Low Carbon Devon, which is an EDRF funded project at University of Plymouth. Thanks, Indy. Next slide. So the Low Carbon Devon project in, is aligned with the um, Devon climate emergency in terms of what it means to be low carbon. So as I'm sure you're all aware, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has advised that carbon emissions must reduce globally by at least 45% by 2030 from the 2010 levels and reach net zero by 2050 if we're to avoid the worst effects of climate change by keeping warming below 1.5 degrees. So within the Low Carbon Devon project, we're taking various different actions to try and contribute to positive impact um, in addressing the low carbon agenda. So next, um, and one of those things that the um, Devon Carbon Plan is really advocating is um, creating a resilient net zero Devon where people and nature thrive. So in our collaboration with the Green Minds Project and Mobility Hubs, those three areas coming together beautifully. Next slide, please, Indy. So um, in the university, we have a carbon reduction program in the university buildings, and there was a retrofit of the sustainability hub, and we've got this beautiful green wall also inside and out, and it won a skier gold rating for the renovation here. 
Next slide. So also within the Low Carbon Devon project, we're supporting Devon SMEs. So that's um, businesses, enterprises, organizations with not to 250 employees with a knowledge and exchange program um, around what they can do specific to their organizations um, in relation to low carbon. And we also have an internship program, which is a fully funded for um, graduates and students one to three months to work with organizations. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that might be relevant to you um, later on. Also within the Low Carbon Devon project, um, there's support and research from three different research, uh, sorry, four different research areas. So there's the Green Living Wall, energy efficient behaviours and occupant, um, energy, energy efficient buildings and occupant behaviour, power electronics and solar PV and creative industries, which is the area I'm working in. Next slide, please. So within the creative industries area, we're working with SMEs to develop new products, processes and services. We're investigating how the creative industries across Devon and beyond are engaging with the low carbon agenda and their environmental impact. And we're looking at how we can help develop this. And we're also working with a series of umbrella organisations to, in a range of different ways, um, to help communicate this message and support makers. And one of the things that we've done is develop the Green Maker Initiative, which is open to all um, designer makers across the Southwest. And it's hosted by the Devon Guild of Craftsmen. It's free for anyone to join. So please have a look at that if you're interested. And then we're also facilitating opportunities for creatives to engage themselves and others in the low carbon agenda. And that's where our collaboration with Green Minds and Mobility Hubs came about. Next slide, please, Indy. Um, so one of the key things that we're really advocating, and this has um, come partly from Dr. David Sargent at University of Plymouth, is the power of imagination in enabling change. And that's written into the Devon Carbon Plan and it runs throughout the Low Carbon Devon Project. So um, we're very excited to be collaborating with Green Minds and Mobility Hubs uh, in developing this project. And we'll talk a little bit more later on about how we'll be specifically supporting you in the producing of your projects that are awarded the, the funding. Thank you. Great, thank you, Emma, Indy and Chris. Um, as you can see, it is quite a quite a partnership effort. This um, so really now, after giving you a bit of a private project overview, before we start to get into some of the nitty gritty, I just thought it'd be really nice to to share a bit of inspiration. Um, I know in Green Minds we've been picking up a lot of the work around nature connectedness, and a lot of that that work and that research has come out of um, University of Derby's uh, nature connectedness research uh, group. So I'm really excited to say that we've got Carly Butler, one of the lead researchers um, at the University of Derby, who's going to uh, just talk a bit, a bit about the work that they're doing and also um, uh, share some of the, the work they've actually been doing on the ground around um, sort of arts and its role in supporting nature connection. So thank you so much, Carly, for your time today. And um, if you want to share your screen, if you've got a presentation, um, anyway, over to you. I'm really excited. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'll, I'll bring my screen up. Um, no, I've lost my thing. So hopefully. That's great. Yep. Um, I'm just getting the slideshow up. Sorry. Right. Okay. Are we good? It's all that's there. That looks great. Yep, wonderful. Fabulous. Okay, um, I'm going to. I've got a lot to say and very little time to say it, so I'm going to um, try and go fast. But if I'm going too fast, just wave at me and, and get me to slow down. So yes, so I am um, Carly Butler from the Nature Connectedness Research Group at University of Derby. Um, what I'm going to do is to just give an overview of, of the work we do, the, the concept of nature connectedness, um, and particularly the pathways to, to nature connectedness. Um, jumping straight in, um, the question is what, what is nature connectedness? And what we're talking about here is essentially a person's sense of their relationship with nature. Um, so, you know, how, how close we feel to nature, um, our, our, our ties to nature effectively, 
And it's something that's quite different from nature contact and time in nature. Um, there's often a lot of emphasis around people, you know, people just need to spend more time amongst the trees um, and at parks and beaches. We know all of that's really good, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people have a close relationship with nature. Um, so at the heart of this is a, it's an emotional um, connection that we would have um, with, with nature and natural environments. Um, it's understood now as a, as a psychological construct. So this is something that's recognized internationally. Um, it's something that we can measure so we can give scales to people um, and find out the extent of their connection to nature. It's malleable. So in that sense, it can be changed. Um, it's not something that we're born with, but you know, it, can, it can grow, we can get a stronger connection or weaker connection. Um, but generally, once people start to get a stronger connection to nature, um, it, it lasts. Um, so it can persist over a long period of time um, and is, is something that's meaningful. Um, why, in terms of why it matters, so first of all, for human well-being. So it's really been um, good for people. Um, in particular, you know, having a strong relationship to, to nature, a stronger nature connection, um, basically helps us feel good and function well. So there's been a, a couple of kind of meta-analyses, so analysing all the data from a whole range of studies, um, and the evidence is pretty clear that if people are connected to nature, they have greater sense of vitality, energy for life, um, meaning, purpose, a, a whole bunch of different measures of well-being. Um, secondly, it matters for nature's well-being. So again, another kind of meta-analysis looking at, at all the research, which has all the individual studies, putting them all together. Um, we know that people who feel more connected to nature do more to protect it. They're more likely to um, plant for pollinators, to recycle, to pick up litter and so on. Um, and yeah, so, so it matters in both of those things. Um, so for humans and for nature. In terms of how we increase it, um, the evidence keeps on showing us that time is not enough, you know, it, it doesn't matter. And, and some of the analyses, um, there's a very little, there's a very weak connection between how much time people spend in nature and how close they feel to nature or to their, their pro-environmental behaviours. Um, and similarly, knowledge isn't enough. Um, so we don't get an increased nature connectedness by knowing more about it, by engaging with it in a, from a more kind of scientific perspective. Um, it's very much uh, an emotional sense that we have with nature. Um, so people need these moments with nature, uh, noticing the natural world and actively engaging with it. Um, we know from big nationwide national studies that people often don't take the time um, to, to notice nature, to engage with it. So 80% of people rarely or never watch wildlife, smell wildflowers or, or take photos of nature. Okay, so while there's more of us spending time in it, um, you know, there's, there's not this level of attention. Um, I have lost my time, so I don't know, I don't know if I'm, how much time I'm taking, um, just, yeah. You're fine, Carl. You're fine. fine. Yeah, we've got good. Good another, <laughs> another five minutes, and then we'll have if if, um, if that covers it, then great. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay. Um, so some of the research that's been done by the the Nature Connectedness Research Group is looking at how we how we develop a sense of nature connectedness, um, and has been running various interventions that that encourage people to create these moments and engage with nature. Um, and one of the big studies was looking at these different pathways to nature connectedness. So we know that people relate to nature in all sorts of different ways, um, but a lot of those ways of relating are um, not good for us and not good for the planet. So some of the pathways around kind of domination and control um, and, and understanding nature and, and those sorts of ways. Um, but the pathways that come up as having the strongest relationship to nature connectedness um, are through senses, through emotion, beauty, meaning, and compassion. Um, so the research group has 
applied these pathways and worked with different organizations to help them identify ways of creating these pathways for people um, to lead to stronger nature connectedness. Um, so the work with the National Trust, uh, 30 Days Wild, um, and, and, and various conservation groups. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of whiz through <laughs> these next three slides um, because I've got examples of these in, in pieces of art, which is going to be more applicable. So senses to look, listen, and, and touch nature, emotion to, to find joy and calm in nature and natural spaces, um, to notice the beauty of nature, um, to explore and celebrate how nature brings meaning. So this is through, this is, a, as you'll see, a big one for art, um, but also the kind of celebrations of nature, the, the rituals um, and, and symbolism that we find in nature. Um, and through compassion, so taking actions that are good for nature can help develop um, connection. Okay, so the arts and creative industries offer a really exciting way of, of developing nature connectedness. Um, first of all, because it's offering a sensory experience most of the time and, and an aesthetic experience, which involves an emotional um, response to, to a piece of work or engaging with the work. It invites a search for meaning. Um, it will invoke emotions so that can kind of amplify the messages that are carried um, and by activating them can lead to compassion and inspire action. Um, there's also the fact that arts-based approaches can, because they're linked to culture and once we can start to shift cultures um, and, and work on this level, um, there's a potential for really deep kind of social environmental change. Um, so the university has been working um, in collaboration with the Oak Project, so it's a not-for-profit that aims to use nature connection, um, or to use art to promote nature connectedness, um, and I'm going to briefly talk about a couple of works um, that have been commissioned as, as part of the Oak Project. Um, so the first here is at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Um, so Silence Alone in the World of Wounds by Studio Morrison. Um, and this is a circular space that's created out of sustainable materials. Um, so wood and a thatched kind of heather roof. It's um, open in the middle. So you have the trees kind of coming up through the building. The building's created around the trees. And it's designed to um, deteriorate, to degrade, and eventually kind of fall away um, into nothing. Um, so people are invited to walk into the space, um, to be silent, um, to sit and reflect. So it's described by, by the artists as a gift of time and attention. Okay, so in terms of the pathways, um, in terms of the senses, it gives a, a space, a time, a silence that, that heightens our kind of sensory awareness. So people become aware of the the structure itself but also the nature around and is very much kind of an integrated part of the work. Um, feelings of calm and peace, uh, the sense of beauty because it's a, an aesthetically pleasing piece um, but also seeing nature from this new perspective um, invokes um, a, a different way of appreciating nature's beauty. Because the space invites reflection um, that encourages people to, to take meaning from the work, uh, there's a narrative from the artist, so a sign outside the exhibit and as part of the project. The title itself invites people to, to think of the meaning um, and to consider the nature of life. Um, and in terms of compassion, again, this comes through the narrative around the work, but also emerges from thinking about the meaning of it, the, the fragility of the natural, material, natural materials. Um, it's produced in a compassionate way through sustainable materials um, and the invitation for action. Uh, the second piece is Great Oaks from Little Acorns Grow. So this is produced by Charlotte Smithson. Um, and just last week was presented for, exhibited at the, the RHS Chelsea Flower Show. Um, so this involved uh, a lot of like test tubes and chemist flasks with water in, um, in which individual 
stems um, and, and plants were, were displayed. In some cases, um, like avocado seeds or apple pips that had, had rooted, so you could see them in, in the glass water. And they're all suspended from the shape of chlorophyll at the top of the exhibit space um, with, with nylon, nylon thread. Um, so again, in terms of sensors, there's an invitation for people to look closely. Um, and once you see all the individual plants in isolation, um, and also the, the water would highlight things like the prickles on the stems of the flowers, for example. So the fact that nature is taken, presented in a different way from what we're normally used to invites us to, to sense it in a different way. Um, space and light is important here and kind of seeing the unseen aspects of nature's. So it's quite a, a sensory experience. Um, it invites, well, it, it's a, it evokes calm and joy, uh, wonder and awe. Um, Having, having kind of I was stood on the stand for a couple of days and seeing people come around the corner and you can see you really see it in people's faces a sense of awe of seeing it um comments about it being beautiful so again it's aesthetically pleasing it's a blend here of you've got the natural beauty of the plants but the artistic beauty through the display so bringing those two forms of nature together is really powerful triggers emotions um, there's a lot of meaning behind the work in terms of the plants that choose chosen so these are all kind of um, useful plants used in medicine um, and, and, and dyes and fabrics um, but the invitation as well is for people to give back so not just take from nature we're always using it but nature can help us we can we can also help it too so that links again into this compassion um, the, the, the fragility of the plants and, and, and again through the design, so circular design, everything in the, in the display is recycled. The plants themselves will be recycled into a, to a vase at the end of the, end of the project. Um, again, time-wise, am I okay? Have I got two more minutes? Is that okay? Yeah, a couple more minutes, that'd be brilliant. Thanks. For yeah, coming. okay. So the evaluations are still in progress, but what we're looking at um, in for silence um, is for increases, well, changes in well-being. Um, we're measuring nature connectedness to see if it changes in response to, to experiencing silence, conservation behaviors, uh, whether the pathways are activated. So do people take meaning? Do they engage their senses? Um, and comments and reflections on the work. So because silence is more of a, an experience, so people enter the space and spend time in there, um, we're doing a, a a study before they go in, um, straight after they've been in, and then following up a month later to see if there's a lasting change. Um, Great Oaks was quite different because it was a, a kind of a fleeting moment within a really big and busy show. So our focus there is on people's experiences of the show, um, of the of the exhibit. Okay, so yeah, summary. So the idea is to form a new relationship. We use the pathways to nature connectedness. Um, Arts and creative industries can use these pathways to either facilitate activities for the public or create works that create moments for the public um, through, through tapping into these different pathways. And the key would be inviting people to tune in, to notice, engage, reflect, and, and celebrate nature. Um, and that's it. I have a list of contacts and emails and things. I can post all that in the chat if that's helpful. That would be great. Thank you, Carly. I feel like I want to feel like is we could do with a with a whole session on that. There's so yes. much in there, isn't there? Like I feel like we could just spend a workshop looking at that. Um, I do want to just there's a couple of a couple of questions okay. um, I'd like to kind of squeeze in because I think yeah. they're relevant to everyone. Um, one of the questions that someone posted was really about how how you measure it. So I know I've had a bit a look around the the nature connectedness index work that you've got as well, but obviously we're talking about huge array of different types of activity but it might be worth touching particularly on that nature connected index I think. Yes yeah um, yeah so again there are multiple ways of, of doing that and I guess the one you would choose would depend on um, how much time is best suited for people to, to do the survey um, to do the measures. There's a um, so for silence we just use the inclusion of nature and self scale which is a um, you get a series of circles so one circle represents nature, one represents the self, and, and they're either completely separate to the point where they overlap, and you ask people which best represents their relationship with nature. That's useful because it's just one item, um, and, and when people don't have much time, then that, 
that's easier um, to use. But yeah, there's the Nature Connection Index, which again is only six questions. Um, these are all accessible through Miles's, um, through his blog, Finding Nature. He's got the Nature Connection Index. So that, that's available there. That's great. I definitely recommend, I posted the, the um, university's research group link, but also on your slide, um, uh, Miles Rich and his Finding Nature blogs are great, accessible. There's, you know, there's really useful tools in there, but also it's, he's, um, he's very uh, good at communicating some of these ideas and some of these things that you're trying out with your research in a, in a really um, accessible, applicable way. So yeah, definitely recommend having a look at that. And there was one more question before we, uh, before we do move on, was around, um, someone was asking if you've um, studied performing arts in the context of Nature Connection. Um, I, at the moment, no, but I think that there's, there's projects um, underway involving that. So there's Gemma Collard Stokes, I think, is doing some work around nature connection and, and, and dance. Um, so we haven't done any research yet, but there is there are the other people that are starting to, to do that. And yeah, there's lots of potential there for that. Yeah. Thank you. I do feel like we had, we did have a bit of an email chat about whether we could look at doing a, sort of a more in-depth session on some of this. So it'd be great to pick up that conversation after this. But just wanted to thank you because I know you you know you, you squeeze a lot of information in there. But I yeah, it's it's been really useful to draw out particularly this pathways to nature connection as well. And thank you so much for your time, Carly. Great. So I feel I feel sad to be rushing on because I feel like it's the whole kind of discussion there yeah. to be had but we've got to think about the practicalities and nuts yeah. and bolts of this commission now so I'm really again pleased and, and very grateful to have Hannah Harris the CEO of Plymouth uh, Culture with us today and I know Hannah was particularly keen to um, support on kind of a really practical side as well as drawing on Plymouth Culture's uh, networks and support but also um the, the really useful stuff about putting in proposals for funding bids and and some of those tips and techniques around that so thank you so much for joining us Hannah today um so I'll hand over to you thank you thanks and sorry for the panic caused at the start I think for some reason I was named as you Gemma so um oh. I, I have been here the whole time uh, enjoying the presentations and uh, they've been great so so thanks very much and thank you for the introduction so yes and um, as, as Gemma mentioned um I work for Plymouth Culture. We have a real keen interest in, in how these commissions are going to shape up and um, uh, for many reasons. And so what I'm going to do, I'll, I'll screen share and I'm just going to um, kind of provide a little bit of an overview of why um, these commissions are kind of so connected to the work that we're doing more broadly in the city. Um, and then to go on to some very, very practical things about um, applying. And some of those will be teaching you to suck eggs, I'm sure, but also are really important that we reiterate them. And then I want to talk just a little bit more um, around co-commissioning and kind of what that really means. It's a really strong element within these within these commissions. Uh, and so the co-creation element and the, the sort of spectrum of that and what that means. And I've got some examples of creatives and others working across the city um, who sort of sit on that spectrum. So I just want to give a bit of an overview to that to get you thinking about how you might respond to that particular element of these commissions. So firstly, I just wanted to um, kind of draw your attention to the work that we have been doing around the culture plan for the city. So many of you will be aware that we launched um, earlier this year um, the culture plan, a 10 year culture plan for the city of Plymouth. It very much builds on the work that has been done over the last 10 years to build their energy, enthusiasm and sort of value around culture in the city. Um, and I have to say that as a as a city, we are very fortunate to have the support that we have for, for the culture and creative sector. Um, and and, and sort of the, the strategy really is not just about the next big shiny thing, but is much more about how do we connect those assets. And in particular, the vision is very much about rooting this work in Plymouth. And of course, our natural environment plays a huge part in that. And um, one is our unique selling point and our kind of asset, but equally in terms of the connection between nature, whether that's blue or green spaces, and our well-being, our value of culture, our expression of culture. Um, so actually it's it's kind of writ large within our within our culture plan. Um, and so I've just pulled out some of our, we have three key drivers. One of those is community. Um, and the and we've got the statement there. Sorry, I'm trying to move my screen around so I can actually see. 
also caught on here, um, that will use culture and creativity to kind of nurture community engagement, to build happy, um, healthy, empowered and connected communities. And there's a lot of synergy in terms of the commissions and what we're talking about here. How do people reconnect um, to nature, but also the communities around them and equally how our art, you know, the role that artists play in helping that connection. Oh move on for some reason there we go um and another of our key drivers is the environment so we've stated up front that we'll be a city of culture with green credentials using culture and creativity to tackle the climate emergency and i think what we're really expressing here is that lots of cultural organizations or events such as festivals try and you know are working on being carbon neutral or being uh, sustainably friendly and you know plastic free but actually there's a step beyond that we can do as a as a sector which other sectors don't have which is that ability to engage people um to to open conversation about what i think for many is this really challenging quite frightening thought about the climate emergency and how do you start that conversation with people how do you support local and hyper local and individual activism that builds towards this bigger solution so i think we've recognized within the strategy that creative and cultural sector plays a huge part in opening those conversations and activating communities to actually um, respond and sort of engage in that more global conversation as part of this, we've, we also have um, some ambition statements within the strategy that are very clearly about, as a city, how we will respond to these key drivers. One of them is about making cultural experiences kind of part of the everyday. And I think these commissions are really interesting in that context. You know, how what, how, what does it look like to place art and creativity into public space, in particular green spaces and um, the corridors that were described? So where people people will be doing other things in those spaces and that there's that en encouragement to engage in a different way and then equally that we've stated within our ambition statements is around this element of co-creation so how do we move away from just audiences consuming and us looking at ourselves as the presenters of art and culture and actually move much more towards this co-creation model where audiences are participants, but they are also decision makers. They are the curators and the producers and the artists and the creatives themselves in, in making and shaping our cultural offer within the city. Um, and, and we'll come back to just talk about that in a little bit uh, more in, in more detail. But I think what I wanted to do was just frame this to show that actually this work is is not, you know, it's, it's funded, but it's not a one off thing for us as a city we have as part of our 10-year plan these core priorities around the environment around co-creation and we see this um this program very much as contributing to kind of realizing some of the ambitions we have and so we're super interested in the learning that will come out of this and how we disseminate that and how we enable other artists and creatives but also communities to kind of continue this work beyond beyond the commissions and beyond the funding so we're really interested in that kind of legacy piece as well. So here's the dry nuts and bolts that you will all be aware, but it doesn't hurt to check ourselves on every now and again. Um, and so now thinking about the actual submission and the sort of um, application process. And, and this is just from my experience of, of having assessed a lot of projects um, and, and put calls together is I can't emphasize enough how often I read an amazing submission and get to the end and still don't quite know what the proposal is. And I know that sounds so basic, but there comes a point sometimes where we're answering the question so much, we lose the sort of overall concept. Um, and so for me, there's something very important about clarity and focus of your applications you know where is the need what has driven this what is it connected to how does it link the objectives you know there needs to be that flow through on what we're reading particularly as the panel will be made up of a variety of people who might not know your work and, and might be um, coming from different perspectives on the commission, there needs to be that kind of clarity that um, you'd be surprised how often is missing from proposals that get very animated and excited, but, 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 but lose the kind of detail of what we're actually commissioning here. We've, I find it really important, the sort of storytelling element, particularly with these commissions, you know, they're, they're multi-dimensional. So it's not just what is your artwork, 
it is you know how does it respond to the co-creation element how does it link to the, the the sort of headline brief you know what is the thematic that it's with how does it you know um bring people into the conversation engage people but also what's that connection to nature so there's there's the kind of multi-pronged elements to these particular commissions which means that storytelling element is so critical it's not just what is the artwork you're going to produce but it is how it responds to all of these things and actually what, what Carly was just showing in terms of the breakdown of the examples she gave there in terms of you know how it works with the senses how it works with the beauty and and engagement and reflection it was a really useful way to show you know what we see is one thing but actually the the multi-dimensional element to it behind that is really critical and kind of using that storytelling element to bring that through in the applications is just incredibly helpful for for the assessor to kind of take us on a journey with you uh, i think one thing um that's again very very basic and obvious is about the use of language so i think sometimes we might be used to applying to particular funds, whether it's Arts Council or whether it's innovation funds, or we might be, be used to talking to a particular audience, whether that's a creative audience or community audience or, or, or a business audience. And either way, it's that kind of adaptability on your pitch around the language. So these briefs are very specific about whether they are focusing on regenerative work or whether it's about green spaces, rewilding, whatever that focus might be they're very specific and there is particular language in there that has particular meaning and so we really want to understand how the work that's being proposed actually directly responds to that and, and to do that we need to hear that language we need to be clear that there's an understanding from the propositions that you're putting forward um, that they're directly responding to the brief that's in that's in play and so mirroring that language, making sure that you're clear on what those definitions are, if it's not something you've come across before and how your work relates to it, it's absolutely critical across the application process. Um, we do ask, and, 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 and the brief will, will break this down, but one of the key questions is around track record and, and credentials. And I think um, we're particularly keen to understand whether you've worked in these sort of spaces before, in these ways before around co-creation as, as well as with nature. And some of you may, you know, some of you might be stepping into this for the first time. So you've done similar work, but not in this context, perhaps, or you've done aspects of co-creation, but you're looking at another another um, piece of that um, spectrum and that's absolutely fine you know it, it, we're not just looking for people to replicate work they've done before absolutely not there's an element of of risk taking and also there's a really strong support structure that, that Emma kind of outlined previously behind the whole commissions in terms of how you will be connected uh, to the partner organisations, whether that's Plymouth Culture, or whether that's Low Carbon Devon, and how that sort of production work will, will support you. But to understand the skills you are bringing to this mix, what you have done previously, that's relevant, even if it's not the same, um, because, you know, this, this, these are in public spaces. These are really um, important thematics that we're picking up on. So we need to understand how your, your skills and track records can be brought into that mix. And then equally, what support might need to be wrapped around you to, um, to make the, the ambitions you have uh, a reality. Um, I, put, I put this here. Um, let them know what their money buys them. Um, and I, I mean them as in funders and I think there's one thing to talk about the work um, and the detail of that and, and what is involved but as has been highlighted to today from all the speakers there is something about the legacy that we're really interested in here this is about supporting behavioral change as much as anything so yes we want beauty and awe and engagement but what is it driving people to act on or what might be the future opportunities? What do you want people to take away from this? So it's not to say that the artwork in any way would be permanent. That's not what we're talking about in terms of legacy. But what we're aware of is this, this piece, however temporary or um, sort of transient in the space has a legacy to it and we want to understand what that might be for the people who've engaged in the project with you and also the people who might see it and um, what they might go on to so um and again not to say that you would have to manage that legacy but just to have an understanding of 
how this piece and your work might contribute to what we've discussed earlier today around the kind of strategy for both green minds but also the culture plan for the city um, is really is really important for us to get a sense of how we piece these quite different briefs together collectively so there's a sort of collective impact of that um, and for you to have an understanding of how your work um, has that like, kind of long-term impact on those that engage with it see it or, or are part of it and um, that's that's really important for us and something we, we would want to understand through the submissions that you pop in so that's the kind of, you know, the day to day, I know it sounds very obvious, but um, really important for us, particularly if you're stepping into this space for the first time. Um, so I just wanted to, to come back to the, the key point around co-creation. It's a really important element of the briefs. It's something that they all have in common. Um, and some uh, resources here, which again, I can pop into the chat later, um, that I would really recommend you reading and having a look at before going into that application process. Um, the first is around cultural democracy and practice, which was um, produced by 64 Million Artists, which is an organisation um, that really looks at celebrating the fact that everyone is creative, um, you don't have to be an artist to be creative, um, and has done work over many years about encouraging people to just do those small moments of creativity in their day, um, whatever that looks like. And they were commissioned by Arts Council to, I guess, start to unpack what we mean by cultural democracy. It's a kind of term am amongst many others um, in the sector that's become quite trendy um, and sort of splashed around quite a lot and appears to be a sort of ambition for many, but what does it look like in practice? And so cultural democracy really starts to look at how we as individuals, organisations, and, and in this case as a city, value creativity wherever it might come from. So, you know, it's not that concept any longer that arts institutions or organisations are the creatives, the curators, and they will advise and build knowledge in people about the arts sector. But it's about how that culture creativity comes from all um, areas of society, comes from grassroots as well as established organisations, and how we value that, how we encourage that and create space for that to come forward. And not just for it to happen, but how it then influences the, the work, the, the creative and cultural sector that we have in play. So it's again describing that spectrum um, and that we might be at various stages of that and that's okay, um, but how we really build that into the work that we're doing. Um, and then there's another piece of work that the Arts Council have done very recently um, con called Considering Co-Creation. Um, which was produced in, in June of this year, so it's the, the latest piece. Again, it sort of tries to look at what we mean by co-creation. It refers back to the idea that there is a, a spectrum, but really usefully that it, you know, it is about moving people beyond just consulting with the public and our audiences and actually actively involving them and how we take that further and further each time so the involvement moves to them being involved in decision making and then moves to them being involved in making the work or commissioning the work and sort of how we might move on that journey to a way um, as a city for us you know how we have more engaged communities in shaping and making culture and cultural decisions within the city um, and they usefully start to look at some definitions um you know that i think the key thing is that there is there isn't a central definition but there is a spectrum so there are different elements that can be considered in your work and actually in the cultural democracy um, in practice document they have this really useful table that kind of says you might be doing this at, at, at present if you were to move more towards cultural democracy it might look like this and it's those sort of examples of how you'd shift up your practice um, some in very small ways and, and others more substantive to move into that co-creation space i think what's really interesting in all of these is the role of the artist um, and and how how your role shifts and needs to shift um, as you move along that spectrum um, as artist facilitator engager questioner um, curiosity master um, and and sort of how you might adopt those roles and, and be comfortable to play those roles as you engage um, with the, the co-creators in 
in, in a more in-depth and kind of long-term way. So I'd encourage you to look at both of those documents. I'll pop those in the chat. Um, this isn't defined by any means. I don't think any of those documents are describing a definition to this work, but they do talk about how it's increasingly important. And again, it comes back to the Arts Council's Let create, Let's Create strategy, which again, I, I guess much like the culture strategy we have for the city, isn't doesn't describe the next big buildings or projects that we will run, but describes how we will uncover creativity, encourage creativity, become stewards and facilitators for that, rather than just presenters and exhibitors. Um, and so I think they're, they're interesting reads and might help you to think about how your practice either does this or, or might move into this space. So some examples, many of you will be aware of these, but just to get you thinking about that spectrum and where you might sit or might want to sit on that. Um, so Hatchling, which was the um, giant dragon that kind of roamed the streets for a couple of days and then flew off of the hoe, um, had a number of dimensions to it that were um, about engaging with communities and, and having um, them involved in some of the work. So on a practical level, and this references some of the work that Chris has offered through the students at the art college, there was um, real engagement and, and we're talking years now because obviously the COVID delay meant that the project ran for a lot longer than anticipated as well but from the very beginning even before this was built or anything like that engaged with uh, students but also local creatives and artists to become part of the build crew and part of the operating crew and um, there were opportunities for internships and um, production roles um, that meant that there was a sort of local crew that came on the whole journey with the dragon and helped to build its character and its personality, helped to understand how it might engage. Um, so on a, on a sort of very basic level, that, that was some of the work that was done. Um, one of the really interesting things um, that Hatchling did as well, and some of you um, might have, have been part of that, and, and it and it it was kind of cut short as a result of various things in the city, as you're all aware of. But they looked at hosting this kind of people's assembly element to, to Hatchling. So taking the concept that a dragon has arrived in your city and what do you do about it? And building on the theme of migration and immigration and Plymouth as a welcoming city opened this sort of debate around what people wanted to do, where it should go, how it should be treated, what it might need and what we were prepared to give. Um, and, and I think that was a really interesting example of that kind of engagement piece around, yes, something has descended in the city, but you as a as a public and an audience can decide what happens to it and how it's treated. Um, so I think there are ways in which you can bring that engagement in and help decision making as part of the process. And that kind of people's assembly approach is, is quite an interesting one and potentially a slightly gentler inroad for people to express their views and their comments in a way that's um, means they don't necessarily have to be artistic, um, but can engage in the conversation at least. Another example that sort of moves this on a little bit, that idea um, is still still moving. So collective of artists in the city, um, probably most known for the work most recently around Mayflower 400, which had no new worlds um, illuminated on the Mountbatten Pier. But their process is really interesting. And for this in particular, it was very in depth, um, two, twofold really. They hosted a number of workshops with um, community groups and individuals and um, audiences um, to look at what those words might be and what they mean to people and how they might emerge out of the conversation. And they've used this format recently with the work that they did around uh, G7 in Cargis Bay. So local workshops identifying words and meanings and concepts that they would want to sort of put out into the public realm and then working with those groups to actually um, make the light works and kind of construct them in a modular way. Um, I think what's really interesting about the work they've done off of the back of this is the partners as it's brought in. Um, so Letters to the Earth, for example, ha have partnered with them. Uh, really understanding that this, to some extent, very simple installation has had a ripple effect in opening up a conversation about the climate emergency and about people's response to it and um, association with it. 
Um, and so have been able to partner with organisations that really have built on that workshop element and really brought people's ideas to the fore and which has directly led to the work and installations that's been produced. So they allow those kind of workshops to dictate kind of what the words are um, and, and make decisions around the meaning that it has for those communities. Um, on the flip side to that as well, throughout this process, they held um, sort of, uh, for want of a better word, sort of scratch nights with the artistic community and partners as well. So when things were not fully formed, when things were sort of in developmental stage, concept stage, they held these sort of focus groups, working groups with um, the more crea creative um, partners within the city, just to really test their thinking, to really push their understanding, to really make sure that what they were presenting was being received in a certain way. And if it wasn't, why was that? And how could that work? So. Um, I think it's not to forget that within these spaces there are multiple audiences and there are those that will engage with work and there are those that are, are sort of creatives and peers to this work as well who might have a role to play in helping you as a practitioner shape the work or, or influence some of the decision making process. Um, I'm sort of, in theory, moving us down this spectrum um, with these examples. So Heritage Sparks, which is a recent a uh, piece of work that the, the box and pop are putting together, um, at, but have done work around the community sparks and vital sparks previously, is a different approach where small pots of funding are made available to individuals and groups to, to come up with concepts about how they might respond to a theme. So this is particularly around the conservation area in the city centre and our sort of high street and how that might be revived um, and people have an opportunity to apply for funding for projects that they want to see happen in this space this is civic, civic square and civic center as it was um, and so this is interesting because again the role of the organization in this project is different and is more of a producer role so rather than the box presenting a series of projects and inviting the public to participate they're giving the opportunity for individuals um, and collectives to come forward with the ideas. Um, and then they are, are providing, it's, it's Fiona Evans who manages these projects, providing Fiona more as a producer in that space. So you, you lead on this, it's your project, it's your concept, but I'll help to facilitate to remove barriers and unlock doors and help you to consider how you might move the project on and how you might craft it. Um, but it's fundamentally that individual or community's project. Um, and so that's quite, um, it, it's, it's kind of quite a brave structure. But I think what's really interesting is the role that Fiona plays in those projects is very different. And I think it's important for you to think when you're submitting what role as the artist you might play with these community conversations, these in, this engagement work and the co-creation and what that means for you to be more of a facilitator and producer at times rather than uh, a, a maker to some extent and how you have to inevitably throughout this process move in and out of those roles. And then the, the one I have here is um, I think sort of the sort of furthest end of the spectrum is Take Apart, which many of you will be aware, they've operated in the city for many years. They work in a very embedded way with communities, so they sort of become part of the community on a long term basis. So you're talking sort of 10 years within communities and um, they've worked in efforts a great deal and um, are, are doing a lot of work now in Coxside. Um, and always their work is about co-creating with the communities. So they don't deliver anything that doesn't come through community conversation, that isn't driven by demand and desire of those people living, working, um, traveling into those spaces. Um, and again, act as producers and facilitators and connectors to empower those communities to lead those projects. So in every, in every example, their legacy is often that the community runs those projects then, or that the community sets up organizations that can apply for funding to deliver projects. So they have a very, um, they have a very tried and tested method of co-creation. It's absolutely what they're built on uh, and the fabric of their organization. Um, and this, you know, this is one example of the projects they do. They've done many. Um, that have led to the actual community commissioning work. So um, we're in a slightly different position because obviously we have the commissions out. But again, I think they're a really 
interesting exciting example that we have here in the city to have a look at how they approach those things they've also published a lot of documentation around methodology and approach um, some of the challenges but also some of the impact they've done so another good example all based here in the city that um, I'd encourage you to have a look at and who have worked very closely with the um, green infrastructure and green minds team previously so um, are fully aware of the the work that, that's happening now so um, I hope that's been useful as a kind of here's a very practical stuff through to where we're seeing this happen in the city and why we're, we think it's so important to driving us forward strategically. Um, and I'll just open it. I've got I've left some time, Gemma, just for some questions, if that's um, helpful. Yeah, that that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Hannah. That's a really clear run through. And I think probably by the fact that We've only got one or two questions appeared in the chat. I think you've covered a lot of ground. So if, if anyone else has got any other questions, probably pick them up, pop them in the chat. I just want to say, I, I feel, I don't know, I, even having some awareness, I feel kind of like a renewed excitement for the culture in Plymouth. And I think sometimes just it also, as well as that process that you've taken us through, but seeing some of the image in the work that is happening in Plymouth, it is really exciting. It's something to feel kind of uh, really proud of. Yeah. Um, so yes, thank because kind of like reignited that you know that kind of passion and enthusiasm and and as as you reference as well probably over the last 10 years I've worked a lot with organizations like ten, take apart and seen the value of that yeah. creative process the arts process in green spaces in blue spaces and how it can just open up a really new way not just connecting space but also um people's kind of value of where they live and 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 those spaces around them as well so again obviously that's where some of that commission work has come from too so we, that's a really strong part although we've kind of got themes for the brief that we'll go into in a bit more detail we're, we're really uh, keen and really open to, to how those are shaped in the context of spaces and particular communities and we'll talk a bit more about how well how we can support that as well and, and kind of guide that process with some of the networks and relationships that we already have so um, thank you so much um, Hannah for that um, I I think in terms of I don't think we've got any anything too challenging on the question front I think somebody was just asking if we could share the record of the chat as well so I think Hayley and the university I think that should be okay hopefully that should be fine when we share out the recording I don't think it should be a problem so we'll do that as well because I'm aware we have put a lot of resources in the chat as well as the um, presentations and then one more question um, yeah, so the, the brief hasn't been, is the kind of call hasn't gone out. Again, we will talk a bit more about that a bit later this afternoon. Um, it's going to go out tomorrow. So we'll, we will cover that shortly. Uh, it should be out sort of tomorrow lunchtime. And we'll make sure you're registered on the portal. <laughs> the flying Plymouth. It's like there's like neon lights around it. Um, so you'll get the alert for that as well. Um, if you are registered on the portal, we'll talk about it later on the supplying portal. But you can also search for Green Minds Commission, Mobility Hubs Commission, it will come up. So, um, but we will cover that. Um, can we run our proposals? But so we we can't necessarily. So there's a question asking about whether we could run proposals um, by any of the partners involved before advice. Um, we can't kind of comment on in individual proposals. That's partly why we're putting this workshop together and quite a lot of in, um, information out here and a chance to ask questions now, so that we've got that level playing field that everybody has got opportunity. To, to kind of raise queries um, but you can if you've got specific queries as your proposal develops you can put those we do have to channel everything through this supplying the southwest portal um, so that, that is just the system we have but yes we will pick up those queries if, if you've got specific things that emerge as your proposal develops as well um, so we'll talk more about that. So I think some 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 of those questions really are about the procurement. So we will pick up those um, in a little bit. Um, so yeah, just thank you very much, Hannah, for that. Um, we did think before we go, the kind of last section is really looking at the briefs in a bit more detail. So that might also raise some questions, but um, we thought we'd just take the opportunity because I'm aware, you know, it's sort of, well, ho it hopefully we might finish ahead of the schedule, two and a half hours, but it's quite a chunk of time. So we're going to take a five minute break now just to allow people to go and get a cup of tea, nip to the loo. Um, and again, if you think of any questions as the rest of the sort of second hour, as the last hour develops, then pop them in the chat and we'll, there's going to be a chance throughout the last session to respond to questions as well. So you might start thinking a bit more detail um, as well. Um, so I'll pick, I think there are a couple more questions coming in, but I might I might try and pick those up 
after the break because they're quite they're quite specific to some of the briefs. Um, so if we could all be back at twenty past one, and um, we will we will start on time again so that we've got enough time for the, for the last session. So there's a few I do see there's a few more questions picking um, coming in on those specifics. So we do, we will make time to pick those up after the break. But um, yeah, thank you, and I'll see you in five minutes. Thanks. Hi, Gemma. I just can say, are you aware that we're still recording? We're, we're recording the break, just to mention before anyone that's has to always chat. good to know. Yes, yeah. that's always good to know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> always helpful. I'm just looking at the questions so I can pick pick up some of those um, detailed ones after the break. It's good. Right, I'll give everyone another minute or two to get back in and then we'll um we'll crack on. Right, hopefully everyone is returning, returning after the break. Um, just a little chance to stretch your legs. Um, 
before we crack on with some of the detail around the briefs, I just was going to pick up on some of the questions. There's three questions that are very sort of similar theme that have come in. Um, so someone was asking if, so Chloe asking if new collectives can apply and evidence their skills practitioner as an individual practitioner. I think that that would that'd be absolutely fine. Don't have an issue with that again, um, as long as you can kind of link back to experience, experiences you've all had, um, then yeah, great. Um, so in terms of commissions being open to local individuals and organization, um, part of, uh, partly we're funded through low carbon Devon. So there is, you know, you have to be a Devon based creative. And again, we'll pick up a little bit what, what that about, what that means in more detail in a minute. Um, so yeah, it, the idea is that we are supporting local creative industries and can you submit a proposal? Suzanne, in which you're solely the facilitator, but have you not yet spoken with artists and scientists who'd be recruited to produce the work? I think what we'd want to see in that proposal again is, is, is enough detail that to, to see how that might work and um, and perhaps um, uh, some of the ideas of how um, some of the, ideas of the artists or scientists that you would work with to produce the work, I guess, because partly we'd want to know about their experience and track record as well. Um, particularly where these works are all going to uh, be working with different community groups or organisations, um, neighbourhoods. So we'd want to see, um, we probably want to see a little bit more ab ab about uh, um, uh, some kind of firmer ideas around the artists or scientists that you might work with, because they will also have to work with communities. So we need to see, um, have a bit more information about how that would work as well. I think it's fair to say. All right, so over to our briefs now this is the nitty gritty um, um as we said before um these are about um kind of some of the, the broad themes that we have for each of our briefs um so we're going to um my, my colleague at plymouth um city council and the mobility hubs indy is going to to kind of share a bit more about our overarching approach so all of the briefs have this approach but each of those eight briefs will have a, a specific theme and kind of engagement focus that it, it picks up. So I'll hand over now to Indy, um, who will um, share some of the brief information. So thank you, Indy. Thanks, Gemma. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, as Gemma uh, just mentioned, uh, these are going to be uh, consistent areas across all eight of the briefs. Um, so as previously mentioned, each of the creative commissions will be part of an overall series. Um, so between Mobility Hubs, Green Minds and No Carbon Devon, we've pulled together uh, the overarching brief split down into the section shown on the screen there. Um, so beginning with our approach, sorry, I'll just move the slide on. Um, so beginning with our approach, as previously mentioned, all of the commissions are open to all Devon based creative industries. Um, we're really interested to see uh, different creative perceptions that are taken from our brief. So we do really encourage, um, yeah, different creative applications. Um, of course, each commission should follow the low carbon and sustainability agenda, which is uh, um, at the heart of all our respective projects. Um, low Carbon Devon will offer support throughout the creative process, of which um, Emma will go into further detail shortly. Um, further support will be offered uh, through Mo Mobility Hubs, Green Minds and Green Minds Project Partners, including uh, PCA and Plymouth Culture. Um, this support includes all parties working together to promote the projects via a range of platforms um, and launch events or exhibitions. Um, and finally, the Green Minds and Mobility Hubs project will be able to offer support and guidance to the engagement process uh, that will be required between creatives and communities. Um, or user groups. Um, so yeah, that support will be offered if and where required. Um, creative engagement, of course, is a vital element within all eight of the uh, Creative Commission briefs. Um, so within, the br within those briefs, we have detailed some guidance and expectations out of the creative engagement element of the project. Um, so beginning, it, beginning with the requirement of uh, the co-creation approach, which um, Hannah um, discuss in much further detail um, and we will be posting some guidance in the chat also around that co-creation uh, co creation approach. Um, so we would like to see the creatives facilitate public engagement and develop the work in collaboration with local residents and, rele uh, and relevant groups selected for each commission. 
Um, the creative works should be shaped by the knowledge, wisdom and experiences of local participants. Um, and we hope the engagement will help grow and mould um, some of the ideas and content which is then put into the, those creative commissions. Um, we aim for the creative engagement activities to be fun and um, informative and productive and empowering for, for uh, local participants and also enable them to develop new skills and explore, document and share their experiences uh, throughout the process um, in a visual and creative way. Um, so we do have certain eligibility criteria uh, that creative applicants will need to meet with. Um, in order to meet with Low Carbon Devon's terms of SME, uh, the Commission Creatives or Creative Enterprises will need to meet the bullet points shown on the screen, uh, which include limitations to um, turnover, annual balance sheet, uh, employees and so on. Um, I won't read all of those out, but I'll just leave those on the screen um, for you to read over. Um, creatives must provide their own public liability insurance and um, any creative wishing to submit proposals for the brief will need to be registered on Supply in the Southwest, as previously mentioned. So please, if you haven't registered already, if you could try to do that today, otherwise you won't be, you won't be able to receive those briefs. Um, Finally, uh, we may hold uh, potential interviews on the 3rd or 4th of November, um, but there'll be further details about, about those potential interviews once the proposals have been uh, collected. Great, so just um, breaking down uh, some of the um, guidance that we've provided in the brief around the proposal. Um, so We've provided guidance um, reflecting what information we would like to see included within the proposals. Um, I've outlined those over the next couple of slides, but within those briefs, uh, it goes into further detail. Um, so of course, beginning with your creative industry sector. So a background into your work and experience um, as previously mentioned. And if you've conducted similar work, um, any evidence of that in the form of a portfolio folder or website will be really beneficial. Um, details of your preferred methods and approaches to co-creation. Um, so we really want to have a, uh, an idea of how you're going to approach that co-creation as um, it's a key element of um, the creative commissions. Um, particularly when working with communities, um, yeah, we just want to know how you will uh, carry out that engagement with the communities. Um, the identification of uh, particular communities or groups that you are planning to work with for that particular commission um, and uh, also an outline plan of development for the creative work that you have in mind, as well as as well as um, methods of evaluation. Uh, finally, we will require uh, specific information such as an outline of time frame, um, budget breakdown. Uh, disability and accessibility statements and risk assessments, including a COVID impact assessment. So uh, just to give a quick run through of the timeframes that we're looking at for the project. So the proposal deadline uh, we are setting as the 18th of October. Um, as previously mentioned, we may hold interviews on the 3rd and 4th of November. Um, we aim to have all creatives commissioned by early November and the, all eight commissions to be delivered between winter 2021 and spring 2022. However, for the Mobility Hubs commissions, we would like all, uh, all three of the creative commissions to be delivered by April 2022. Um, and finally, we will have a final exhibition um, or launch uh, of the commissions um, of which the, of which the date is yet to be decided, so we can um, provide further details on that later in the process. Um, so unless Gemma and Emma have anything further to add to that overarching brief, um, I'll now pass on to Emma to uh, run through low carbon Devon support throughout the process. Thanks, Indy. I'll just share my screen. So um, as the Low Carbon Devon partner, um, we'll be supporting the Creative Commissions in a number of different ways. So there'll be scheduled production meetings to support the progress of the commissions. 
So we will discuss the kind of time frame of those with the um, particular award holders. Um, there's the option for a fully funded one to three month graduate or student internship. Um, and that's subject to eligibility, but that would come through Low Carbon Devon. So that could be um, a student or graduate of any discipline that might be relevant to you. So it could be um, a science or um, environmental science graduate, or it could be um, a media student or whatever would be relevant. Um, and also Low Carbon Devon will help promote um, the finished product uh, projects and um, help with the events um, to promote those as well. And so one thing we'd like to sort of emphasize is, and I think this has been touched on, um, but just to really sort of bring this home is we are very interested in commissions coming from across the creative industries. So um, that could include any of the um, 12 stroke 13 subsectors from um, heritage to TV, radio, animation, um, product design. Um, it could be any visual arts, of course, uh, any of these different areas. Um, so we really welcome a variety of different applications. So um, yes, we encourage you to apply and good luck. Thanks, um, Emma and Indy. I think, Indy, we're going to start to um, cover your briefs in a bit more detail now. So over to the low, uh, Mobility Hub. Uh, yep, three I'll briefs. just share my screen again. Do -do -do. OK, great. Um, Perfect. So to uh, get into specifics around the Mobility Hub's creative commission briefs. Um, so the Mobility Hub's project is uh, commissioning three creative commissions. Um, all three briefs are open to any mediums. Um, we do really encourage uh, lots of different kind of creative perspectives and be really interested to see what's taken from our briefs that we've put together. So, yeah, really encourage um, creativity within those proposals. Um, each brief has a specific theme for the commission to follow and a user group for creatives to engage and co-create with, as um, mentioned throughout the session. Um, we haven't been particularly specific around areas of the city or particular communities that we want uh, creatives to engage with, as this is a city-wide project. Um, so that area is pretty flexible. However, we do want to, partic uh, we do want to target particular user groups um, who may have different perspectives and uses for the mobility hub. So that's what we've focused on within the briefs. Um, the themes have been informed by findings from previous public consultations that I referenced to earlier. Um, so we carried out those consultations towards the beginning of the project where we asked attendees how they would uh, like to be engaged with and what topics of areas uh, were of interest. So that information that we collected has informed the themes that we have put together. Um, so all three of the uh, briefs have the same priorities and outcomes aimed for uh, that we're aiming for out of the creative works. Um, so these consist of reaching new audiences for the Mobility Hubs project, engaging local communities, creating excitement within uh, local areas, hopefully leading to the encouragement of use of the Mobility Hubs. Um, it's a real priority to us that the creative works are accessible to as many as possible, as this is what we're striving for across the Mobility Hubs project. Um, we hope to educate on low carbon transport and its benefits, um, address concerns or barriers that different user groups may have when thinking about incorporating Mobility Hubs into their everyday lives. Um, get people to ask questions if people are asking questions about around the project, um, they are engaged. So that is really what we're hoping for. Sorry, I'm just lost my page. Um, and then finally, we want to engage with uh, the public on the issues and allow local people to feel part of the project and take ownership of their local mobility hubs, which uh, will be delivered in the next um, yeah, couple of years. Great. So uh, the first of the Mobility Hub Creative Commission briefs is titled Getting Connected. Um, so the theme for this commission is new technology. 
Um, so new technology is a fairly prominent feature within the mobility hubs and um, examples that are going to be incorporated into the hubs include electric bikes, electric vehicle charge points, um, electric, electric vehicles, as well as booking systems and payment methods. Um, so we understand that not everyone is comfortable um, or familiar with new technologies that are going to be incorporated. And we want to begin tackling some of those barriers that individuals may have and demystifying some of that unfamiliar technology in educational and fun and accessible ways through the creative commissions. Um, creative work, of course, is a great way to get people thinking and asking questions. And that's really what we're striving for within this creative commission and begin tackling some of those barriers that people may have around the new technology. New technology can be a quite uh, intimidating feature. So just getting people to start asking questions will hopefully make them feel more familiar and uh, start making green transport the preferred option to get around the city. Um, the user group we would like this uh, creative commission to engage with um, is younger people. So within the age bracket of 16 to 25. Um, this group incorporates those who may not currently have the resources for a private car or an electric bike, but have a massive need for a transport in and around the city, uh, whether that be for education or for work. Um, so we really want to demonstrate uh, to younger people what the mobility hubs can offer to them and also get them thinking about the long term positive impact switching to low carbon transport can have on our city and, um, of course, on our environment as a whole. Um, this group has the opportunity to instill long term behavior change within their transport choices. And we really like to get that started and um, yeah, get younger people thinking about how their transport choices um, can affect our. Um, can affect our environment. Um, great. So the next Mobility Hubs Creative Commission is titled Keeping Nature in Mind. Um, so the theme for this commission is how transport choices affect nature. Um, and I think this is a really important and prominent topic within sustainability um, and to get people thinking about the tang tangible effects uh, that their everyday transport choices have on. Um, sorry, uh, the tangible effects that their everyday transport choices has and also be to begin prompt uh, prompting that behavior change. Um, this commission could incorporate the effects switching to low carbon transport has on air quality and or congestion across the city and how, th how that um, affects our local nature. Um, we, want the, we want to make this information accessible to local people in a fun and exciting way and encourage them to switch from uh, using their pe uh, private petrol or diesel vehicles to a more sustainable form of transport. Um, this team also gives a great opportunity to link to the work of Grain Minds in a playful and innovative way, um, particularly relating to their work with nature connectedness and exploring how that relates and affects um, everyday sustainable choices. Um, the, the user group that we would like to be engaged with for keeping nature in mind is commuters. Um, so commuters are, of course, one of the main target audiences for the Mobility Hubs project. Um, as they have everyday need to travel in and around the city and also are likely to have a higher car, high, uh, are likely to have a higher private car ownership, um, which can make it trickier to approach a behavior change. Um, so we want to get commuters thinking about how they move around the city and begin instilling behavior change by demonstrating the impact of their transport choice and the benefits of green, of green transport. Finally, uh, the last of the Mobility Hub Creative Commissions is titled Our Greener Journeys. Um, so the theme for this Creative Commission is user experiences of low carbon transport. Um, within our initial public consultations around community engagement, sharing user stories was commonly mentioned as an effective way to engage with local people and begin tackling some of those individual personal barriers uh, local residents may have when thinking about incorporating um, the mobility hubs or low carbon transport into their everyday lives. Um, we want to create and gather uh, local people's positive experiences of low carbon transport and demonstrate to, uh, demonstrate to others how switching from private petrol slash diesel vehicles is achievable and also the benefits that they're experiencing for making the switch. 
Um, we hope through sharing personal user stories, those local communities and residents who are unsure or hesitant will be able to relate to the stories being told. Um, and we really want to facilitate the opportunity uh, for community members to learn off one another's experiences in a playful, informative and accessible way. Um, so the final user group for our greener journeys is um, those without access to good transportation. Uh, so we would like to take this engagement opportunity to demonstrate to this user group how the mobility hubs will expand transport options across the city and uh, what the new transport options can offer to individuals. Um, it's vitally important that we demonstrate the mobility hubs are relevant to everyone and um, reflect how the transport choices can be effectively applied into everyday lives and begin to address any barriers that we may come across. Great, um, so that's a quick, well, a quick overview of um, the three mobility hubs briefs. Um, so I'll pass, on, pass over to Gemma to run through um, Green Minds. That's brilliant. Thank you, Indy. And thanks, everyone. I, I appreciate you're getting a lot of information today. <laughs> and I kind of feel like that I've got a lot of thoughts just from some of the other presentations as well. They've kind of sparked some things in my own heads and I'm kind of in it. So um, that's partly why we're recording it and we'll share the recording, the presentation. So uh, hopefully you're not feeling too overwhelmed, but getting a kind of flavour of it. We just want to, again, try and open out some of this information before the kind of more the kind of formal tender kind of process and documents um, kind of come out too. So we, we're going to cover the five um, Green Minds briefs now. Um, and, a, and a bit like Indy, this has come out of the last sort of 18 months of engagement with different communities, uh, kind of different sectors as well. Um, and I work with um, Plymouth, College, Plymouth College of Art too. So I'm, I'm actually going to uh, um, hand over to my colleague, Emmy um, Reedman, who's the campaign uh, communications and engagement, no, campaigns and engagement officer, sorry, um, with, with us at Green Minds. And again, um, colleagues, um, Chris and Alexandra at Plymouth College of Art too. So Amy's going to kick off with the, with, the, with, the, with the first three briefs and then we'll hand over to the College of Arts. So I think, Amy, you're going to share your screen. Cracking. Thank you very much, Gemma. Okay. How's this looking, guys? Are we able to see this? Yep, yeah, I can see the power, but I think you just need Brilliant. to start it. Then. Excellent, sure. cool. Okay, so um, thank you, Gemma, and thank you to everybody who is oh. attending. It's really exciting to have so many wonderful creatives on a call with us oh. and um, so many cultural experts as well. Um, we, I'm about to go through the first three uh, Green Minds briefs that we've put together and um, then my colleague Chris at PCA is going to go through the final two. Um, the briefs, I'm excited by them to be perfectly honest, they've got their own characters and um, in that way they're much like the communities in Plymouth who we're, we're trying to engage, we're hoping to engage together with you. Um, underpinning all of them is the nature connection approach which Carly kindly talked about earlier, so I'm um, thinking about each tender will need to support some of the, the five key pathways to nature connectedness um, from the University of Derby Nature, nature Connectedness Research Group. Um, so that's the senses, emotion, beauty, meaning and compassion. So we're very much hoping to underpin all of the briefs that we, we put out and that we receive um, submissions for with, with those uh, key fundamental features. Um, in terms of my engagement with you guys. So I'm the um, engagement and campaigns officer, although uh, I answer to most things. Um, and my work with you will be around supporting, engaging with audiences in Plymouth. We, we appreciate that not necessarily everybody on this call is, is working within Plymouth yet. Um, you're a very welcome, very welcome addition uh, if you're, if you're uh, more broadly spaced out in Devon. Um, but as Hannah from Plymouth Culture said, communities at the heart, um, <laughs> at oh sorry Gemma is there, is there something that you can see it, it's not a big deal it was just that we can see all the notes as well so I don't know if you wanted to start the, 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 mm. the slide, but, but it's not that's I mean it's not a big deal it just makes it a bit bigger for people that's all sorry to interrupt your flow and no, that's really annoying no that's that's not a problem at all um I'm not entirely sure how I would get rid of that though um and it's not, it's fine. it's not a big deal all right cool 
I will go from that one. Cool. So um, in terms of the support we can offer, we will engage audiences with you. As Hannah from Plymouth Culture said, community is at the heart of what we're doing. Um, and as part of our summer engagement, the locality came out as key. Um, so in terms of the communities within Plymouth, Plymouth is a big city and all of those pockets within Plymouth are um, very special and very important and they have their own sense of character. Um, so we'd look to support you to reflect that in, in whatever you try to, to work with in the city. Um, we'll also help you tell the story of the engagement. So we would love to hear how you would want to tell that and we will support you through our social media, our websites, um, maybe social media takeovers, that kind of thing. We would support you with that. Um, and also monitoring and evaluation, it's crucial. Um, how, where, who are we working with? Um, and we have some frameworks and we would work with you to, to put together some, some tasty information um, that our funders at the EU and the UIA will, will uh, like to see. So enough of that, On to the exciting bit. Um, the Creative Commission's, this one's, the first one's Generation Restoration. Um, and this very much takes the idea of regenerative art. Um, and there's an idea that we, we really want this commission to, to target particularly young people. So um, what we call our budding leaders. So our future Sylvia Earls and um, Greta Thunbergs in Plymouth. Um, we, would, we would love to be able to do some sort of creative engagement with them. Um, which actively targets restoring nature around the city. Um, as you can see there, the medium is anything. What does that look like? Well, that could be that could be art, that could be comedy, that could be music, that could be folk stories. It could be anything. It could be drama pieces. Um, as long as it's interactive and it's get, engaging with those communities around the city, that's what we want to see. Um, the outcomes and the outputs. There's so. We have the five investment sites that um, Gemma mentioned earlier, um, and there are site specific areas that we could work with, or more broadly, we've, we've got Plymouth as your canvas or your stage, if you prefer. Um, with this commission, you can um, work with the young people directly, or um, there's flexibility within the brief um, for you to consider delivering to um, gatekeepers and professionals who are working with those young people so by that I mean teachers community leaders youth workers we've got um, the youth service in Plymouth we have youth inquiry services in Plymouth how can we um, work with those people who who hold the keys to that audience so the next one the roots in nature so we know that nature is at its best when it's diverse that's where it's healthiest, it's sta most stable, and it's at its most resilient. Um, and it, nature is for everyone, and art is for everyone at its best. Um, so we, we want to have a think about how are and how could the diverse communities of Plymouth access and, and engage with the city's natural environment. Um, at the heart of this one, as you can tell, um, inclusivity is at the key. Obviously, inclusivity is something that we want to consider across all of our work at Green Minds, and within all of the briefs, briefings that we, we um, work through. But this one particularly, we, we really want to focus in on communities um, which aren't necessarily as large or have as, as much of a voice as some of the other communities in the city. Um, so in terms of this one, we, we can think about sensory work. Um, we can think about uh, visual work. So people for whom English isn't their first language potentially, um, people who have different sensory um, abilities or um, preferences or challenges, just thinking about how we can um, work alongside people who experience the world in different ways. Um, Sorry, Emmy, you've you. got a few requests because we're not seeing the next slide, so I don't know if it's just stuck. That's really um, interesting. interesting people a bit. Is it? Okay. So, yeah, so I'm on that side, not, but I'm sorry that you guys uh, aren't. So it might be, a, I don't know if it, sometimes they do get stuck, it's one of those horrible type, you know, technical things. If not, Mm. I could I could try and share. Um, Indy might be able to share her screen, full screen. If that's, so I know sometimes it. Try that again. Is that any better? Is it, if you play it full screen, it might. Yeah. I'm, I'm... Yeah. That's the right one. That's the right one. Yes. Roots in nature. We're, yeah. We're on the slide, but it's just not going full screen for some reason. But. Are you okay. able to change it in the in the view tab to full screen? This it for me it is full screen. 
okay. Which uh, okay. Is I think I've I've had this before with Zoom, and I don't know. I have had it before, so I don't know if it's where we're going in. I don't know. I don't know. Emmy, I've got um, that up. If you want me to share for you, cool. yeah, that'd be great. Thank I'm you. Go for that. Sorry, it's horrible when you're. How, your how tantalising is that? How tantalising <laughs> that I talk about something and you can't see it. <laughs> I can only apologise. No, that's brilliant. It's painful, isn't it? Um, it can be. Okay. Technology. Here we go. I believe that's wonderful. Look at that. Cracking. <laughs> lovely. That was super fun. Brilliant. Cool. Okay. So that's where I was. I don't know where you guys were, were but um, I was in Roots in Nature. And um, with this one, too, so applications will be um, positively encouraged from artists that are from one of the very many diverse backgrounds, um, black and minority ethnic groups within the city. Um, and your work should um, include working with some of these community groups. So proposals that engage with intersectional identities of individual groups and or work with more than one ethnic community. Um, they're of particular interest to us. So um, yeah, that's the one for everybody to jump on board. Okay, so Indy, if you could change the slides, hopefully with some more success than me. Yeah, look at that, brilliant. Um, this one, I have to admit, is really, really exciting. All of them are, but this one's really exciting. This commission's, um, it's focused on storytelling and it um, draws inspiration from Joanna Macy's Council of All Beings, um, where humans are invited to speak on behalf of other spe um, species. So nature speaks, nature has stories to tell. And I think um, storytelling and nature are two sides of the same coin in many ways. It's how we tell those stories, who we tell them to, and how we can get as many people as possible engaged with that. Um, within this commission, it's worth saying that storytelling is understood in its broadest form. Um, and by that, that's something very exciting. So that, that could be performative, that could be rap. Why not? It could be rap. Um, it could be comedy, it could be all of these different things. It could be music, it could be all sorts. Um, and it, it's open to responses across, across all disciplines and mediums. Um, but, and we would expect this, we would love this to have an interactive element um, because that's that's probably when it's at its best. I don't know if any of you have heard of um, the Stiltskin Theatre Company. Um, it's working in Plymouth. They've got a lot of interactive storytelling. It's very popular and it's, um, it really, they, they reach a lot of people. So there are some exciting things going on and it'd be lovely to see what you guys develop as part of it. Um, there's flexibility for you to consider working directly with particular communities. Um, or to focus on developing the co-production skills that we were talking about earlier. Um, again, this is within um, gatekeepers and professionals who will help you to deliver um, to certain different communities. So um, again, we'll be able to support you with those, those contacts, those communities, um, once you're on board with us. And um, we, can, we can try and shape that so that the audience that you're reaching, you have a way in if you don't already. Um, and what are we trying to do with this with this particular one? We're looking to highlight the value of our daily relationship with nature, um, how it enriches us on a daily basis. And that's that's regardless of location. Um, and it's not necessarily with us realizing it. So somebody walking past a street tree and that street tree is maybe 150 years old. What are the stories that that street tree has to tell? Like what what has it seen? How has it seen Plymouth change? So it, there's there's an awful lot of scope to do some very exciting things here. Um, and on that dip bit, I'm going to pass it over to Chris Smith, um, my colleague at PCA, who will go through the final two creative commissions um, associated with Green Minds. Chris, over to you. Well, I, th I think actually we've got a change. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually got Alexandra at, at PCA, one of the project oh. managers, who's also supporting um, Green Minds too. So um, oh. I'm going to ha yeah, uh, hand over Hi. to another, <laughs> another contact at PCA. Thanks, Alexandra. Hi, thank you so much. And I think um, I might just take a moment because it was quite, quite a while ago in this whole presentation now that my colleague Chris spoke about PCA's involvement. And I think now that we've sort of heard more about the commissions, it might just be used to sort of place that again. Um, because PCA is so excited to be part of the Green Minds project and of these commissions. 
Um, and I think because this, this work really is sort of fundamentally part of who we are as a, as a college. Um, we sort of the core value of the college is rooted in sort of a social justice agenda about community impact and creative learning. And we really see that sort of environmental focus and environmental justice as being part of this. Um, so this is just a really wonderful opportunity for us to explore those two sort of dynamics together. Um, and I guess just an example of how embedded that is, um, Plymouth College of Art, one of the key partners that were involved in uh, Plymouth becoming the um, first UK based fab city, which means that Plymouth has a commitment to produce everything that we consume by 2054. And that was back in 2019. Um, so, you know, this is something we've been hugely engaged in. And the, our involvement within the Green Minds project um, to date has been quite focused around the students. And that is, the, um, we're delivering with the students through their curriculum, as well as developing opportunities for them to develop independent practice in the area um, uh, and sort of engage with the Green Minds projects and our partners in a whole variety of forms. Um, and I think that that's really important, that sort of background context is really important to, to think about in relation to our involvement in these briefs because we have been really fundamentally um, engaged with, with the others um, in, who have heard from in developing the briefs and will be part of that sort of selection panel, but also that, that we are really looking for to have a meaningful engagement with these briefs and looking for artists um, in the, all of the briefs and not just the two briefs that I'm about to talk about, prevent, presenting opportunities to us as to how we can have meaningful engagement so whether that's students working on a program perhaps having a talk some element of co-collaboration and um, so when we talk about opportunities to have access to our facilities it's really within that context of that sort of reciprocal relationship and i would really encourage any um, artists for any of the briefs we've heard up to up until this point that in your application, if you do see those opportunities to engage with us or potentially um, want to sort of inquire about the possibility of using any of our facilities, do outline that in your application so that we can have that as part of the conversation um, at the time of interviews and things like that to just ascertain the feasibility or even to find new opportunities with you. And you can find out much more about our, our courses and facilities online. So um, that said about all of those briefs we've sort of heard about up until this point, there are also two briefs where Plymouth College of Art are absolutely sort of intrinsically embedded as co-collaborators in these. So the first of these is the one that we have here on the slide, which is the Naturescape brief. Um, and this um, project is, uh, this brief is one that we're really sort of situating ourselves as, as a co-collaborator on. There's really exciting opportunity that um, we have to work with some of the new technology that we have here at Plymouth of College of Art and with our studio, staff from our studio lab for embodied media. Um, and when I'm talking about the technology that we have, so for example, we've just, um, purchased some HoloLens technology, we've got a 3D environment scanner, and this um, creative technologies brief is really sort of looking um, about how technology can help us have a, a more meaningful interface somehow with nature. So two things that are perhaps quite often put, you know, at different places in the spectrum, but actually how can um, creative technologies and in particular augmented reality actually enhance that relationship? And um, I think because of the, the nature of that, we are really, you know, interested in that student engagement and engaging with young people. But we're also really interested as to how the different levels of engagement that can be reached through this brief. So as well as engaging with our students, where is there an opportunity perhaps to engage with schools or where is there an opportunity to make this feel really accessible to a general public? So within this um, proposal, we would be looking really for sort of multiple levels of, of how this engages with different groups or has some different public element 
And again, we're really open to a broad interpretation of that and for your ideas to come through. Um, so I think that is most of the most of the things on that point. Um, and I, I guess, yeah, it's just a really, really exciting uh, moment for us to work on this, especially you know, in Plymouth College of Art, we um, we have a creative technologies course about to be launched, and we're investing in, in this new equipment. So, definitely, really excited to see what comes out of this one as, as a co collaboration. Um, if you want to move on to the other one, brilliant. And so then, this um, the second one that PCA is really um, sort of an inherent part of is the called the Sapling Micro Commissions. And in this commission, what we're actually looking for is either an individual or an organization or a collective that has a track record of really sort of being engaged with um, socially engaged practice or art in the public realm or some other relevant area of activity who could effectively act as the creative producer to oversee a suite of micro commissions um, for Plymouth College of Arts students. Now, there is a lot of leeway in that in terms of what that might look like. So what we're really sort of our guidance on this is that if the commission is looking to sit at around £7,000 mark, we would expect at least 50% of that to be given to PCA students in the form of micro commissions. Um, with the remainder then having to cover the um, artist fees and any other costs associated with this, which may include things like running workshops to help inspire the students. It will include things like how there might be sort of a public facing aspect of this at the end um, and anything else. Now, the, in terms of the PCA part of the micro commissions, the number of commissions that is represented within that part of the budget um, and the, the level that those commissions sit at, how much each individual one is worth and how those are allocated through any system. That's something that we would really like to hear from you within your proposal as to how you think that that would work to have the most impact um, in terms of delivery and public facing aspect um, and have the most value. So, you know, do, do outline that in your application or in your submission rather, so that we can really hear your ideas around that. Um, so this brief, uh, more so I guess than, than anything for us, really pulls on that, that relationship that, we that we've created between that link between social and environmental justice. So we've posed that as the sort of main question of this. So what are the links between social environmental justice and how can our staff and students engage with that? But as with all of the briefs, really, you know, this is our starting point and, and, and you know, to engage with that in a really broad way um, would be very, very welcome. Um, and obviously, you know, th this one, we're working with our students, so there would be a huge element of, of collaboration here with the college and myself and my colleague Chris, who you met earlier, would be here to sort of assist in the helping access students in the college um, and any other things that you need around that. So we would be a point of contact to help assist through that part of the relationship. I think that's all, all I have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alexandra. And, and thank you again to Plymouth College of Art. I keep adding an S on the end. I'm trying to get into my head now. Why do I keep saying art? Plymouth College of Art. Um, because I, we wouldn't have been able to shape the, the briefs and, and come up with um, a kind of such a wide range of creative responses without you, not just because of the kind of things like the, the links to students and kit and technology that are offering, but also your, your own um, creative input and experience in terms of um, producing um, creative commissions as well. So thank you all. I'm oh gosh, so much to take in, so much to take in, um, and and such kind of exciting thoughts and opportunities today. I just I wanted to kind of finish with the really exciting stuff, but the re again we keep stressing this. We're so worried that people won't uh, have registered on the portal and will miss out on the opportunity to tender. So this is why we're banging on about it so much. Um, so I just wanted to kind of sort of finish with that call again. That supplying the southwest link is up on the slide and in the chat please make sure um, that you register um, pre preferably by the end of today the commission 
uh, is looking, the call is, um, should hopefully be out by the end of tomorrow afternoon. So Wednesday, 29th of September, by the end of the afternoon. You should, if you're registered on that commission, get an email through the portal. I would say check your junk. I do know it's, I think it's a slightly odd email, but to check if you, if you think you're registered, check your junk that you haven't had an email about that. If um, you still haven't had um, a kind of invitation to tender for the work, uh, do um, contact our procurement team. They've actually been very brave, the procurement team, and offered up um, um, our procurement contact, our procurement an analyst contact there directly. Um, Emmy or India are going to pop uh, Sarah Stevens' um, uh, email in the uh, chat now so that you can directly inquire with um, procurement if you've got any concerns about whether you've registered correctly, not received the tender, et cetera. The other thing you can also do is search on the portal for either you know, Green Minds Creative Commission, Mobility Hubs Creative Commission, and you'll see those there. They are out as two separate kind of lot briefs, if you like. So all the Green Minds Commissions are under uh, kind of one piece of procurement, and you can apply, as I've said in the chat, for one of those, or you might want to apply for multiple, for multiple um, uh, briefs. But bear in mind that uh, you'll have to put it together a separate proposal for each brief that you want to apply for. You can also obviously apply for some of the Green Mind briefs as well as the Mobility Hub briefs as well. So just make sure you you submit all of those um, as and individual proposals for that. So that, um, it's also just re worth reiterating we don't we've kind of got a budget for these creative commissions, um, but when until we see the proposals, we're not sure which which brief will, you know, it's not a fixed amount, but just as a guide really to help guide your proposals, the Green Minds briefs are looking at around 7,000 each and the Mobility Hub's around 6,000 each. So just bear that in mind when you're putting, just in terms of the scale of your proposals and putting those things together as well. So I think that is it on the procurement side of things. We will, uh, everyone that's registered for today's workshop, will be sharing that with our procurement team as well as other people we know that have registered an interest um, but just do keep an eye on that and please do get in touch with procurement if, if again like I said I can't stress that enough please contact them if you're not sure if you've got you've had that call or not uh, so I think that's it on the uh, procurement essentials um, hopefully bear with that process I do think it's worth it because we can do some really exciting things together particularly looking at this as a, a whole series of um, you know, overarching briefs and commissions and, and the stories that we can be telling in Plymouth um, through the connection to the kind of the kind of climate agenda and the ecological crisis. So it's, uh, you know, these are big issues to deal with, but I think we've got to keep that sense of joy and playfulness. Um, and this is part of what we want to do. Um, and as Hannah Harris said, you know, thinking of them as you know, parts of that sort of behaviour change towards um, uh, towards nature, towards our climate in Plymouth as well. I think we've got something we can hopefully be really celebrating too. Um, I think that in terms of questions, I think most of them have been picked up in the chat. Um, so hopefully that's clear. Again, you can um, pick up queries after this. We'll, we'll share out um, the recording. Um, hopefully we'll do that within the next day. Um, and I think that's all the information. I just want to say with a final thank you, thank you to all of those who've given up your time to attend. As, as participants to find out more, but also obviously a really big thank you to those people who've spoken. So to Hannah Harris at Plymouth Culture, Carly Butler at the University of Derby, our partners, Plymouth um, College of Arts. And I know um, that my colleagues in Low Carbon Devon and Mobility Hubs um, are just really grateful uh, to kind of have your time on this and, and your energy and inspiration and creativity. But we're also just really excited to see this. It's taken us a little while to pull it together with some of the the difficulties are around legislation and funders and procurement but we're really excited that we're finally getting going and we're just looking so much looking forward to seeing those proposals come in so um i'm just taking the questions for one last time we will stay on the chat a couple of minutes to finish up but um uh, just just want i just want to check it one more time Oh, about inter creating partnerships, that would be great. I think if anybody does on the back of today want to form some collaborations when they see um, uh, the kind of people involved um, and who participated today, I think that would be, yeah, that would that would be great. So I think uh, I will just keep one eye on the chat and if there's anything else we want to pick up, we will. But um, otherwise, I just want to thank you all um, for your attendance and um, look forward to hearing from you. So thank you very much.